Good afternoon, I'm Charity Wallace, and I serve as the Managing Director and Senior Advisor to the CEO for Global Women's Issues at the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, or the DFC. Um, we call our Global Women's Issues Office 2X because of the multiplier effect that investing in women produces. And that's what we're thrilled to be here to talk about today on our panel. And I'm really honored to be moderating this strategic dialogue today with such a distinguished panel of individuals from all over the world. Today, I'm joined by Mary Ellen Iskandarian, the CEO of Women's World Banking, C.D. Glenn, President and CEO of the U.S. African Development Foundation, Carmen Correa, COO of Pro Mujer, Dr. Ruth Schaber, Founder and President of Tara Health Foundation, and Thelma Ekior, Managing Partner for SMENG, which is Nigeria's impact investment platform. So the title for our session today is Fixing Systems, Financing Solutions. And I'd like to spend a couple minutes at the top framing our conversation and then really digging in with our panelists. So to start, we'll just talk a little bit about research. Research supports that pursuing a gender lens strategy to level the investment and capacity gap for women around the world really stands to expand our global GDP significantly while also delivering immense social benefit. And I know other main stage panels have been speaking about this just recently today. Arguably, the biggest missed market opportunity is that of women. McKinsey Global Institute found that eliminating gender disparities in employment sector wages and credit would add an additional 12 to 28 trillion dollars to the global GDP by 2025. So as we can see, women represent an immense global opportunity, but they still face persistent challenges, including a roughly $300 billion shortfall in access to credit, which I'm sure some of our panelists will suss out further. And this really prevents them from reaching their full potential. Women are less likely than men to have access to technology, which again was addressed earlier in a, in a panel. They're less, they have less access to education, home loans, financial services, quality healthcare, and even paying jobs. And these disparities are most pronounced in the developing world. Worldwide, roughly 700 million fewer women than men have paid employment. Women are three times more likely than men to undertake unpaid work and home work. And this has actually increased significantly during COVID. However, data shows that investing in projects that are women owned, women led, women supporting, or which offer a product or service that benefits women, it results in stronger families and communities and more stable and prosperous countries. And really, that is why the DFC, as well as all of the organizations represented on our panel today, place such a strong emphasis on gender lens investing. So I'm proud to say that at the DFC, the 2X Women's Initiative has mobilized more than $3 billion worldwide to projects that advance women's economic empowerment. And last month at our 2X Americas event, which was hosted by the DFC and Concordia, we actually announced a new commitment to mobilize $6 billion over the next three years. And really that is bringing private sector along with the DFC to ensure that more women are empowered economically. The interesting part about 2X to me is that when it was launched just two years ago, only a handful of transactions would have qualified as a 2X deal. But once OPIC, which is the, which is the former DFC, um, applied intentionality around gender lens investing, we've actually now been able to close almost 100. We're at 99 2X deals with more than 110 in our pipeline. So all of us on the panel today are working to ensure that we can sustain and build on the progress that's been made to economically empower women amid unprecedented challenges the world now faces. Because women are disproportionately impacted by crises, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated several existing vulnerabilities for women, particularly as it relates to financial hardships, seeking access to capital and to health. So in our conversation, we're about to start, I want to explore partnership opportunities that strengthen policy and processes underpinning, underpinning gender lens investing around the world. 
And I also want to discuss promising approaches and strategies, the role of investors and policymakers in moving capital and opportunities in the post-COVID world to maintain and mainstream gender lens investing. So if we've talked about it. We hope this to be an interactive dialogue in which we can discuss each one of our um, each one of the panelists and how what they're doing to solve these pressing issues around the world. And because Concordia has always been an encourager of public private partnerships, we also hope to explore and identify opportunities, really concrete ones that will develop potential collaborations and partnerships. So with that, I'm going to start with Mary Ellen Iskandarian. After 17 years at the IFC, Mary Ellen joined Women's World Banking as the CEO in 2006 and she leads the global team. Women's World Banking is a global nonprofit devoted to giving low-income women in the developing world access to financial tools and resources they require in order to achieve security and prosperity. And the neat part is DFC and Women's World Banking have been working together. Earlier this year, the DFC closed on an investment of $25 million into Women's World Banking's $100 million fund of which 100% of that investment will be for women supporting opportunities. So Mary Ellen, starting with you, just tell us about Women's World Banking's work, how you define gender lens investing, and comment on, I know you all have been doing some really great research related to the impacts of COVID on women and would just love to discuss that part of it. So eager to hear over to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Charity. And thank you so much for including me in, in this panel. Because, And I think it's it's not only so important that we're talking about gender lens investment, but that you've brought um, so many different sectors, health, education, together. Because I think the, the intersections of those are particularly notable and particularly ripe for gender lens investing. Um, you described Women's World Banking very well. Since our, our founding 40 years ago, we have been dedicating dedicated to providing access to all financial products and services that many of us would probably take for granted um, in the developed world, bringing those to low-income women in, in developing countries. And to do that, um, we deploy both philanthropic and return seeking capital, um, both with a, a very strong uh, gender lens. Um, I was particularly glad that I was on a panel um, that was entitled Changing Systems, because I think that really is at the root mm -hmm. of why Women's World Banking is so single mindedly focused on more in, building more inclusive financial systems. Um, you know, when the, the SDGs were being created, there was a lot of back and forth. Should financial inclusion be a an SDG? And I I, I think, you know, the the great minds that came together to, to create them really made the right decision in saying it's not necessarily a financial system systems change, financial inclusive financial um, systems aren't necessarily an end in themselves, but they are absolutely the means by which we will be able to achieve you know, all 17 uh, mm -hmm. of, of those goals. So I think it's a it's an important way of thinking about systemic change. If you can drive broader access, broader usage of the range of financial products, you'll see change not just standing on its own, but really happening through a system and therefore is more sustainable. And, you know, you start that that wonderful cycle. Um, the way that we think about investing is really uh, sort of in three three pillars, if you will. Um, and, and I hope you'll see the themes that run through those. The, the, the first through the NGO is to work directly with financial service providers to help them I identify and create and sustain and market and sell yeah. um, products that are, are commercially viable, that can reach low-income women and that serve a need that low-income women have identified. And very often that's um, with a, you know, a cell phone provider that is eager to bring on more, more customers and recognizes that they have to do that by adding financial services, insurance, or even lending uh, to that cell phone. Or you've got a, um, 
uh, we've had some really interesting cases of digital wallets mm -hmm. that they the uh, the company finds that men are really using, but that m women are not. And then it turns out women love the same product, but some of the ways that the product was has been used to reach them were real turnoffs to the mm -hmm. to women, or just really were not in a language that was conducive to bringing women on board. So we, um, you know, we worked with them not on creating some kind of new pink <laughs> product or something, but in in terms of. Um, you know, taking their perfectly good product and making it more accessible to those women. Um, the second is actually investing in the diversity of the financial institutions that we're working with. There is just a, a growing body of research that shows that not only do financial institutions that have diverse leadership and governance um, outperform, but in the case of financial institutions, they take fewer risks. We mm -hmm. saw during the global financial crisis that, you know, that uh, financial institutions that had more women on their boards and in senior management actually made it through the, the crisis on much better footing than, um, than otherwise. Um, and so we have a whole range of training programs in leadership and diversity, both for the direct financial service providers, banks, insurance companies, mobile, um, mobile providers, but also in the last two years, we've been working with regulators because as many of you probably know, there are there aren't many less diverse, gender diverse institutions in the world than central banks and insurance regulators. And so we've been working hard to to build that diversity because, you know, there's no possible way you're going to have a more inclusive financial system if the people who regulate it don't understand, um, you know, the, the importance of diversity. And then um, the, the the last way that we invest is probably the more um, you know straightforward way of thinking about investing, um, which is with our impact investment um, funds business that you alluded to, Charity. We had a fifty million dollar fund that made investments in ten. Um, inclusive finance institutions around the world um, and then proceeded to raise a, a second fund. So we were delighted to uh, to welcome DFC amongst our investors in this in this second fund. And I think that that's a, a good place to maybe take a step back and, and say what gender lens investment really means for women's world banking. Because while I think the definition that you alluded to of, you know, uh, products that women use or in, in uh, businesses that are run by women is is a, a good definition. But I'd say we probably expanded a bit in saying that a gender lens investment isn't necessarily a separate asset class or sh shouldn't really be thought of as a set of investments that are you know off to the side, but that all investors should put that lens on as they look at every stage of the investment. So we found that, you know, as we're choosing investments and, and negotiating investments, particularly at that early stage when we can bring other investors along with us. So if we're in a shareholder group, Women's World Banking isn't the only one that's banging on the table, insisting on having certain um, requirements of women on the board or women in leadership. But you have, you know, everyone around the table um, really aligned on on that same thing. So that, that initial gender lens. And then when we're in the portfolio management phase of, of our work, I think that's where some of our most important um developments have have been uh, have been we require all of our investees to gender disaggregate their reporting mm -hmm. data to us which we were very surprised to find out how that that still remains very rare even in an organization that has sought out you know a women's world banking to be a shareholder um so i think just that transformative effect of actually collecting and using the data and then reporting it to us but we um we also have found that 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 discipline of looking for more diversity both internally and externally um, has has just really made tremendous change from within the organization. Um, the story that I always like to tell and and some of the audience may have even heard me tell the story because it just 
it, it, it really felt like we'd arrived, if you will, as a, as a gender lens investor making impact. And there was a CEO of a wonderful bank in uh, Latin America. We were very proud to be uh, invited into, into this bank as a shareholder. And we joined with the other shareholders that came in at the same financing round um, to put some requirements in because while 86% of the bank's clients were low income women, which was fabulous, they did not have similar diversity amongst the leadership cadre or at the board level. And so we put those requirements in and the CEO year one didn't meet the targets and oh, I tried so hard and year two didn't meet the targets, but he'd really, really tried. And so year three, the compensation committee um, where Women's World Banking was not represented, uh, put a requirement that he have additions in his senior leadership team and additional female um, directors into his performance compensation plan. And I'm happy to tell you that he uh, he got his bonus that year. <laughs> I think making sure that incentives are aligned behind it and that you've got a, a board and a shareholder group that speaks with, with one voice um, is, is a really big part of what we think of as that that gender lens. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it, it, in closing, just to say, I think one of the things that really makes us unique is that approach where we're we're not just trying to rate to reach more women clients, and indeed mm -hmm. we are, and we provide technical assistance to our investees to help them identify. Uh, pockets within the women's market that they may not be aware of and ways that they might be able to tap um, un, you know, previously untapped customers, but also that focus on building more gender diverse institutions internally for better performance. And you know, we're, we're not only seeking to do you know, to do good there, but because we know of that linkage between better financial performance and more diverse uh, leadership teams. We're really hoping that that uh, we'll start to see those those returns in our financial uh, returns as well. So I'll stop there, but really look Thank forward you. to joining the rest of the conversation. No, it's so interesting that correlation and now the data to support it is so critical because we can then apply additional pressure or incentives, as you said, um, to ensure that that is integrated not only as a side piece or a sidecar, if you will, but rather it's integrated fully into the strategy. Um, and, and it actually does increase the returns, which is really terrific. So CD, I am going to go over to you. I'm going to invite you to, to join the conversation. So just as a little intro, um, CD Glenn is the president and CEO of the U.S. African Development Foundation. U.S. ADF is a grant making local capacity development organization that invests in African designed and community led programs. It promotes inclusive economic growth and creates pathways to shared prosperity for underserved, marginalized, poor, and vulnerable populations, including women and girls um, and youth. Um, CD oversees approximately $115 million in philanthropic and social impact investments in more than 1,200 civil society nonprofits, grassroots organizations, and SMEs in 20 country offices that span the African Horn, Sahal, and Great Lakes region. And the one thing, too, that you're great at is um, really being a champion for strategic partnerships and collaborations. So, CD, just talk to us about the mission of US ADF, um, how you factor in gender lens investment strategies into your work. And again, if you've seen anything with regards to COVID-19, how it's impacted your investment strategy, but also collaborations as you focus on those. Thanks so much, Jerry. Thanks, Concordia. Really grateful and glad um, to be here. Um, I also have to say when I'm looking at this screen and I'm surrounded by by women, this is, you know, obviously in a, in a virtual world, you know, a, a, a panel of six and one male is actually refreshing, but I have to say it's a, a virtual world now, but it's actually really also my real world. I have a beautiful wife and three girls, so this feels like home um, in, in, so, in so many ways. I'm always surrounded by women and led by women, so very, very comfortable and glad to be in, in, in this company. So thanks, thanks for inviting me and really, really grateful to be here. Um, US, US ADF, US um, African Development Foundation is an independent government agency established by Congress 
So we have a very unique mission and mandate. And I and I I want to break it down to talk about it in terms of issues that we focus on. Sort of we have a place-based strategy because we only focus on Africa, um, the stage in which we provide grant grant funding, and also obviously the population that we try we try to target. We talk about our mission and our mandate as investing directly in African enterprises, African entrepreneurs. So there's a direct investment um, thesis. And it's really, um, we talk about investment, we do look at a social impact return, environmental impact return, and, and an economic impact and return of our grant capital. So 99% of what we do are, um, we're, a, we're a grant maker. We make grants to make change. So we want to bring about transformational change with catalytic grant, grant funding. We promote uh, local economic development. And so when we think about populations, we're talking about sort of economic driven development, market-based solutions where grant capital can catalyze transformational change all along, let's say an agricultural value change or in an enterprise progression uh, framework. And ultimately we talk about creating and we, we aim to create a pathway to prosperity. You hear this described now from AID as a journey to self-reliance. I mean, however we want to say it, whatever nomenclature we mean, we want to actually um, not only move people up the capital stack, but move them out of poverty in a real way that's that's actually predictable and a real progression. And so that pathway to prosperity isn't isn't um, illustrative. It's, it's, it's real. We really want to create a way out um, and not just manage the poverty that people are going through, but to move them out through, through this catalytic uh, capital. And I talk about that catalytic capital because it's really important. We think about grant funding. Um, so that's the financial support, access to finance, but also just as important is the non-financial aspect um, to capital that we provide. And that's where it's local capacity building, project management support, business development, business advisory support, the non-financial aspects. And then um, lastly, the capital with capacity building, but really the convening and network, um, networking that's necessary. Being an entrepreneur or an early stage enterprise or even a women's cooperative, these, these are tough, these are tough businesses to operate in any environment, but they're also lovely. Where, who, who, who do you go to? Who's focusing on, on, on helping you be successful? So we try to create some kind of network effect where whether you're in Uganda and Kenya or uh, South Sudan and Cote d'Ivoire, how do we create opportunities for shared understanding and connection between some of the investments that we make across the African continent? Focusing again, geographically on the, the places where the real needs and challenges, the Horn of Africa, the Sahel, the Great Lakes regions, where there's a real need for catalytic funding to, again, move people from one stage of, of uh, let's say, poverty, if you will, to a pathway to real, real prosperity. When we talk about populations that we serve, it is about underserved communities. And so this could be smallholder farmers, pastoralists, refugees, but more and more now it's about youth and this demographic dividend or mm -hmm. this demographic bomb bomb because Africa is the youngest continent and and we want to ensure that we are creating a future and Africa's creating a future for its young people but it also is all about the women all of our investments so this is about intentionality and this is about reality we cannot be who we are we cannot do our work without focusing on the 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 drivers of African economic economies especially in the areas where we op where we operate and those are women and so if we're going to be true to taxpayer dollars that we utilize um, in, in investing in populations. We need to do this in the way where we're going to have a real multiplier effect, a real, what we call an impact multiplier. And so investing in and providing grant capital to women is a way, is not something nice to do, it's a must do for us. If we're going to bring about the change to transforming these economies, we have to have women at the forefront of our, of our strategies. And the issues that we focus on are issues that are US government priorities, but also the needs and challenges of Africa. So these are areas of food security. And we all, we all can think of stories around food security and the importance of agriculture, not only to the US government from the Global Food Security Act or Feed the Future US government initiatives, but also the challenges Africa is facing in terms of food insecurity and, and the need for agricultural development. 70% of Africans earn their livelihoods somewhere along the agricultural value chain. So if we're gonna be true to who we are, we need to work on agriculture. Now, 70% of those people who earn their livelihoods along the agricultural value chain are what? Are women. So women are the majority of those that are driving the economies in agriculture. So a large part of our portfolio, over almost up to 70% of all the investments we make on a yearly basis directly into African cooperatives, grassroots organizations, entrepreneurs is directed towards women. 
in agriculture. That's amazing. Another, another area that we, we, we focus on, and that's a challenge for Africa, but that's an opportunity that US, the US government wants to support, is in energy. So the Africa is the third largest continent, uh, continent you know, 1.2 billion people on the continent, 600 million wake up in the dark, go to sleep in the dark. Why? Because no access to power and energy. But the, the poor and vulnerable are paying for power. They're paying for batteries, they're paying for kerosene, they're paying for diesel, they're paying for, for dirty fuels in, in different ways. And so we have a real focus through the Power Africa Initiative, through the Electrify Africa Act out of Congress to really focus around uh, renewable energy and off-grid energy. And this is solar, wind, hydro, biomass, and biogas, energy solutions. And with that, again, focusing on those who drive the economies in Africa, we have an uh, off-grid women in energy challenge. This is where we specifically um, try to identify and target women-owned and operated energy businesses that are African-owned and operated because they're the ones that are driving the economies and they're the ones that are going to be great investments for us, again, to look at catalytic capital to transform lives and livelihoods. So agriculture, energy, and then really honing in on very specifically where, where we see the most, um, I guess, momentum right now, and that is linked to what we all know um, as a new one of the newest initiatives in the U.S. government, which is uh, WGDP, the Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative, and sounds sounds like a great name. Well, what what is it? What is it really all about? Well, we're talking about trying to really be um, a catalyst to help drive transformation in in women's economic empowerment in different ways, and this is including women in the workforce. This is about women as entrepreneurs, and this is also about the enabling environment that women have to operate in. And with WGDP, there's an attention to reach 50 million women by 2025. And so we've partnered with the State Department, interagency collaboration. It's really important in terms of the US government. Mm -hmm. And so they have created an Academy for Women's Entrepreneurship. And this is where they're training, again, 50 million women who are gonna get trained in terms of the mindset and the skill set to look at economic development, economic opportunities, and women's economic empowerment. But that training alone doesn't equal access to capital. So now we have committed uh, to providing up to $10 million in catalytic funding to promising women graduates of the academy. So linking our financing with US, um, with the State Department's Academy for Women's Entrepreneurship. And that is really important because it, it all boils down to connecting African women looking to start and scale up businesses with capital, capacity building, and convening opportunities they need to be successful. You know, over yeah. the course of the past year, we've seen real, real progress in this space. Let me let me Let's stop you there, CD, because we're going to jump to the okay. other three. I don't I want to make sure we have enough time for everybody, but I'd love to come back to that. To your point, WGDP is a really interesting whole of government approach. There are 11 agencies that contribute to it, utilizing our unique resources and tools. Um, so DFC is part of that as well. So the great part is on the continuum with regards to how do we support women? Each one of the agencies has a very unique role and specific tools that we can utilize to empower more women around the world. And to your point, that collaboration amongst right. the agencies is really critical. So we'll come back to it. Um, I'm going to jump to, thank you so much, CD. We're eager to talk more about that. I'm going to jump to Carmen Correa, who is the COO of Promujer. Promujer is one of Latin America's leading women's development organizations with an integrated approach that offers access to finance health and educational services. Um, Carmen has extensive finance experience and uses her expertise on the leadership team at Promujer. So Carmen, over to you, tell us a little bit about the work of Promujer, the successes, and also the unique challenges and opportunities that Latin America and the region face, particularly as it relates to women's economic inclusion and maybe touch on the impact of COVID. Yes, of course. Thank you very much, Charity, for, for this invitation and for the introduction. So, as you said, Promujer creates opportunities so that women in Latin America can build actually their businesses, can gain independence and become really and powerful agents of change for themselves, for their families and for the communities, actually. We have this year we are turning 30 years. So for during these 30 years, Promujer has been committed 
to positively impact the lives of low-income women, underserved women, and their families through an integrated methodology, as you mentioned, where we offer them an access, give them access to finance, health, and also all the educational services they need to scale, to be actually uh, and gain that necessary independence. We look forward to Latin America well, where all women can drive and become actually real agents of change. We want to become a large scalable platform that we, through that platform, we can deliver relevant and scalable and transformative services and resources to women in the region. We have operations in six countries. We have operations in Argentina, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Mexico, Peru, and Guatemala. Over the years, our partners, our allies, are really, it's a really extended network mm -hmm. that it has an integrated, we have been integrating these alliances and partnerships and they have become our DNA, actually. They have been able to allow us to keep scaling, to actually expand our footprint. So our partners are key actors and we believe that we need more partnerships and that we are looking forward to these joint ventures actually to scale and continue offering new and more services to our clients. If in what it has to do to what we have and, and the type of services we have been delivering, in what it has to do to health, actually, we have been delivering more than 400,000 uh, health services in last year alone. We have delivered 45,000 cancer screening in 2019. We have delivered also 37,000 diabetes testing. So you can dimension the amount of services we have been delivering in just one year. What it has to do with financial services, we have, we approach more or less more than 250,000 clients per year. We have been delivering and impacting the lives of more than 2 million women in the 30 years. And we have delivered and deployed more than $3 billion in these 30 years too. Actually, we are trying to expand our strategic focus to invest not only in the capital needs of the women and individual women, but also in the needs of these businesses that can promote gender equality and that really are impacting positively in the, in the lives of women and girls. In, in 2019, Promujar partnered with Ditkan Impact. This is a Canadian organization and we launched the ELO Women's Empowerment Fund to invest in a diversified portfolio of high impact businesses in Latin America and the Caribbean that incorporates gender strategies in their business models. The target fund size in this case is of $35 million with say $27 million right now that are already committed and uh, we have deployed already $14 million in the region. After successfully closing this first fund, we are expecting to go into another round of catalytic investors. Ditkan Impact and Promujer are really planning on a second round. And let me tell you that this fund, it was invested also by DFC Mm -hmm. by the 2x challenge so and we are very happy on working with with them uh, Il, the ilu fund integrates the gender considerations through the full investment process including the implementation of a gender smart evaluation framework framework and also a scorecard for the use of the screening the due diligence and also the monitoring the actually what we are also looking forward is to other 
type of uh, investment and, and other type of financial instruments that can allow women to access financing. We have also developed a partnership with New Ventures Mexico, and we deploy also last year, this is a financial instrument under the name of Piwala for small and growing business companies. And we are also looking forward to other type of uh, financial instruments that we can deliver this year and next one. Our strategic plan focuses on building stronger and more robust organizations. And we are looking forward to keep scaling up with partners and with different long-term alliances that will strengthen and complement the work that we are actually doing right now. And what it has to do with COVID itself, COVID, as you mentioned at the beginning, is a crisis that affects health, but it's also a crisis that is affecting much more and beyond health because it's actually an economic crisis, it's actually a social crisis, a humanitarian crisis, it's affecting everybody, but it, and, and actually COVID, it doesn't discriminate. Mm -hmm. It affects everybody, but it's impacting, not in the same way men and women. Actually, women are the ones that are suffering the most Mm -hmm. COVID reveals and shows much more all the inequality. So at this moment, it is key to work together with different organizations, even with the private sector, in finding solutions. We have to work together. We have to construct and, and, and work on an inclusive economy, not just uh, including the gender uh, purpose, but also working on developing an inclusive economy and to promote and take action. We have to advance on gender lens investing. We have to advance on uh, bridging this gap. Gender lens investing for sure, it will address the existing gap and has a direct and positive impact on women and girls, and especially those living in the low income uh, communities, because those are the most, most affected with this uh, COVID pandemic. That's right. I'm going to stop you there, Carmen. I'm going to switch over to Thelma. Um, but the few things that you brought out and CD actually referenced as well is this idea of networks. And um, when I was working previously on some research, one of the things that I found fascinating is that um, women don't have the same types of networks that men, and yet networks are some of the most, the greatest indicators of a woman's success. Um, so not only is it individual networks, but it's the network of these type of all of our types of organizations working together to connect with one another and utilize, again, those unique tools that we bring to the table. And Carmen, to your point, I think, you know, COVID has been so significant as far as the impact for women. And we're seeing that in all different regions and across the globe. So I want to switch back to the African continent um, with Thelma Ekior, who's the managing partner of SMENG, which is Nigeria's impact investment platform. Thelma has more than 20 years experience working in the development sector as an impact investor, a donor, philanthropic advisor, and social entrepreneur. She has experience in working in 22 African countries. And like I said, is the managing director for Nigeria's impact investment platform, which has set up two impact funds for women entrepreneurs. So Thelma, tell us a little bit about the distinct challenges, opportunities that African women are facing as it relates to full economic inclusion and also some of that impact on COVID. And then also, I would love for you just to quickly touch on the funding space event that you did and, and some of the outcomes of that. Oh, you're on mute. There you go. There. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, it's good to be here. I've been listening um, intently. Um, so I work in Nigeria. Um, the numbers in Nigeria has the most SMEs than anywhere else in Africa. And 
a population of almost 200 million. So when people ask me, why don't you work in more countries? I say, I have enough work to do in Nigeria. Um, the African Development Bank, um, prior to COVID said we ha um, there, was a, there was a $42 billion financing gap for women. Um, that must have quadrupled as a result of COVID. And so in addressing the financing gap um, for women, looking at issues around women's financial inclusion, when we set up SMENG, we deliberately set it up as a platform. And the idea of the platform was we needed to um, attack the problem from different dimensions, looking at the weak ecosystem, looking at um, the, the elitist nature of financing, um, people finance people that they can see, which is people who ha uh, can access the internet, people who are able to put together the best proposals, but Africa is made up of a lot of people you cannot see. And so what happens to those people? And also looking at what we all call in this, in the development world, capacity gaps, but knowing that essentially these capacity, ca capacity gaps can be the difference between a woman staying in poverty and a woman going from poverty to, you know, some level of, um, um, you know, comfortable living. And so we decided to set up a platform that would address all of these issues. Um, that's why it's called SMENG. Now, in doing that, um, the, we, we set up two funds. One fund is the AB fund. It's a bottom of the pyramid fund. And that fund was, you know, my background in working with women all across Africa. I had seen that there was a lot of attention to supporting women with micro lending, mm -hmm. but never letting them leave micro. It was, a, it was almost as if women could not handle big money. And so you had a stranglehold of generational poverty uh, where women were concerned. And so the, the, the AB Fund is designed to break women out of this stranglehold, create pathways for growth for them, for them to get to the meso level and hopefully macro level funding. And then we have a larger uh, fund for, called the Women's Investment Fund, which is essentially to help women scale their businesses. In the research that we conducted prior to SMENG, we couldn't find up to five women's businesses that were intergenerational. Now, this, obviously, if you're talking about strengthening a sector, this is a tragedy because it means with each generation, you're starting all over. And so, and also we were looking at how we can support women to access markets. Now, the, the previous um, analysis of accessing markets when you talk about African countries is accessing Europe and America, but the continent is, is vast. And how do you, for example, in Nigeria, how do you um, support Nigerian women to access Togo, Benin, that are just next door and could be massive markets for these women and it'd be easier for them to even conduct business. And so that's how we created the funds. In doing that, we invested in our own accelerator called She Works Here, because as a donor, as an investor, I would always encounter people, and I'm sure all of you have done the same, saying, well, we can't find pipeline. We can't find pipeline. And we thought, well, we're going to kill that problem by investing in our own accelerator, by constantly having a stream of women coming through. And at the moment, we have 200 women who have graduated from our accelerator. And then you talked about the funding space. You know, we're, I'm here in Concord. I'm talking at a Concordia event. We know the, the importance of convenings, but how many Africans can do this? And so we decided to set up a funding space four years ago as a convening that would bring people to Africa to see African talent, witness what's happening on the ground, and look at how you know you can actually because if you listen to CNN, you'll never come to Nigeria. I can tell you for free. I mean, you just think there's no point going there. But there's so much going on. There's a lot of um, innovation, and Nigeria is leading now in, in terms of tech innovation. But how do you introduce that community to an outside world? And so that's what the funding space is about. And we had it two weeks ago. So we created this platform to. Um, you know, look at these problems, address these problems as indigenous actors, knowing that we could bring our partners to solve the problems on, on the ground in Africa and prevent Africans from getting on those boats where half of them drown and look at how we create viable 
economies that people can invest in. Of course, because I would never do anything without investing in women, the funds are focused on women. And, um, and in doing that, you know, my, I'm part of the African women's feminist movement, and it's really driven by feminist um, philosophy as well, where we look at how, you know, access to finance also represents access to choice, access to options, access to voice, uh, because by and large, many African women are voiceless. And so for us, that's what gender lens investing represents. How do we create a platform that the women that we invest in, actually it, the investment affects their whole lives. Mm -hmm. And we were doing all this, we're very happy, and then COVID happened. And that just, as it did to everyone else in the world, took us back to the drawing board and we said, what do we need to do at this time? And it was very clear to us that for our constituency, what we needed to do was help them keep the lights on. It takes women a lot longer to start businesses than it does men. And so if we're talking about recovery processes through a gender lens, we know that if it takes a man two years, it's possibly going to take a woman six to eight years to do that. And so the, and we also know that there was there's also always a tendency when crisis happens for people to look at women as a homogeneous group. And so we, we carried out a national survey in partnership with the Ministry for Women's Affairs and the National Chambers of Commerce here in Nigeria to look at how COVID had impacted women. And we're very pleased that that survey is now the seminal document has been presented to the president and is being used at the presidency to look at how um, the Nigeria as a country, you know, addresses um, supporting women to recover. But one of the things that the survey really highlighted for us was that the sectors where women predominantly operate hospitality, catering, hairdressing. I couldn't go to my hairdressers for five months. I mean, that in itself was a tragedy. And, you know, all those sectors has, have still not fully recovered. Mm -hmm. And no one is financing them. You know, when we talk about gender lens, for me, what is a lens? A lens is a device through which you look at something and your lens can be skewed right you can be looking at something and it's three times the size or smaller than it should be and covid represents an opportunity for all of us to have a corrective in the lens that we use because the stimulus packages that have passed that have come out in nigeria have essentially been gender blind or deliberately neutral and we know what that means if you don't intentionally mention women women will be overlooked Mm -hmm. and, and the sectors where women operate in are not mentioned at all. And so when we, you know, I'm, I'm privileged to be with a lot of you who are DFIs and donors and all of that. And the, but I think one of the challenges that you all have and we are seeing is that COVID has changed the world, but you're still using old lens to look at how you, you do your financing. And I think that that has to really change because talking to the women, being with the women that we work with, we know that it's certainly, the world changed completely in, in March and April. And the questions that they're asking themselves is not what 2021 is going to look like, is what October is going to look like. And, and, and that is it, it's actually a question of survival. For us, partnership, partnerships are central to our work. Um, I'm privileged to be part of different women's groups here in Africa. There's a movement of women-led funds that I, in a few years people are going to really write about as a revolution that changed the financing space. Uh, here in Nigeria, we started a group called Women Financing Women, and you know it's a support group really because it's very lonely doing this work. And we get together, we talk about the opportunities that exist, but we also support each other's work on the continental level. We have a group called Women in African Investments. Um, and I think some DFIs are starting to join that. And I, it's really good because we're very, very um, blunt and open in terms of the challenges that we face. But critically, we're also going through a process of educating investors that want to invest in women and how they can't look at Africa as one picture, but right. to look right. at what is happening you know, it's definitely going to take Togo, you know, a different time frame to recover than it will Nigeria. But then most people will say, 
even West Africa is the approach. So how do we change this thinking is really, you know, what we're grappling with as we interact with people. Lastly, one of the things that, I mean, all over the papers in Africa and all over in terms of all, all the blogs we're talking about it, people talk about investing in African founders, but, um, you know, they would always look for how they have a non-African person leading the organization. And um, this is, re it, it actually is quite demoralizing because then you have a lot of Africans, even myself, who lived in the West, moved back home, but then you have to be told again that you have to get somebody from the West. And so, you know, I'm, I, I'm sure this is a panel that's doing real talk. So in terms of what is really on the ground, these are things that we need to address if we're talking about changing systems, because the problems that we deal with Africa are deep and systemic, and the approaches have to also be deep and systemic. Thank you. Yeah, and so yeah, I, 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 I think I have my background. Sorry. Okay. So um, one of the things that you're speaking of is the idea. And, and what I'll say is the DFIs have come together to really think through how do we um, better utilize our tools. So from the COVID perspective, I'm actually really proud of the DFC. We've, we looked at our processes, knowing that typically it takes a very long time to get a transaction completed. We created a rapid response facility specifically for COVID so that we could identify specific transactions in which we could unlock liquidity very quickly. So that was like a one to two month process rather than a six to 12 month process. So that's one thing. And the other thing is to your point, um, it is identifying locally run, locally led uh, teams that we can invest in. And it's one of the things from the 2X perspective, as well as the 2X challenge, which is the DFIs that have come together. That's one of the, um, one of the greatest goals of the next year is really identifying those who we can invest in that are on the ground that doesn't need um, someone who's associated with the DFI itself, whether that be Europe or the United States. And so that's something that we've actually been really forward leaning into. So I'm glad to hear you say that because it is part of the systems that need to be changed. And there has to be a different kind of lens as we look to invest. Um, and I, we're fully supportive of that. And actually, the um, DFC just launched our African Investment Advisors Group. So that we have five that we have just um, added to our team that live on the continent um, and, so, and, and are African. And so it's so great because that's one of the things I talked to them last week about is we want to be different in the way in which we're investing and really be locally um, have it be locally led investments. So I'm so thrilled to have you speak on that because it's something that I feel really passionately about as well. So I'm just quickly running over to Dr. Ruth Schaber, who is the founder and president of the Tara Health Foundation, which promotes health, well-being, and opportunity for women and girls through innovative, evidence-informed programs. She's also the co-founder and board chair of Rhea Ventures. Um, Ruth, you have been quoted as saying, ultimately, I believe that traditional paradigm for how foundations drive social change should be turned upside down. So I'd love for you to elaborate further on this and really from a funder's perspective, describe your approach to building a strategy for every asset class, as well as your view on the importance of performance-based measurements. So over to you. All my favorite topics, and I. Anytime anyone asks me to speak on a panel that has systems in the title, I'm I'm there no matter what. So I'm really really pleased, and I've learned so much from all of you already today. So thank you for all the work you're doing. Um, my background is a little different than everybody else's. I'm a physician. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. I had a beautiful career in the States at Kaiser Permanente. In addition to being a clinician, I had many different executive roles, and um, I would say my expertise really came in population care and how do you um, move a very, very complex organization and nothing is more complex than American healthcare um, from um, understanding what the evidence is and what the science is and then actually turning it into implementation and execution. So at the end of my career at Kaiser, I was the queen of evidence-based medicine and, and really understood what it takes in terms of performance improvement measurement and, um, and the, all of the complexities. 
when I had the privilege of launching Tara Health in 2014, it was with the intention of um, bringing all that I had learned about evidence and the utilization of, um, of systems engineering to the fields of philanthropy and investing. And um, based on my background, I chose to focus um, on women's health and particularly on reproductive health because I know that um, access to family planning is not only important for the, um, it, the optimization of that individual woman's um, social and economic outcome, but also her family, her community, and, and as we've seen over and over again in the countries in which they live. Um, so I stayed in my lane and I was very hyper-focused on the United States. But over our um, six years, we've also expanded to include a, a somewhat broader scope of um, improving the lives of women and girls, which includes um, focusing on um, women in the workplace and other aspects of economic empowerment. I think what's really unique, and this gets into that paradigm shift that Charity referred to, um, we're unique in that we're 100% mission aligned. So all of the assets of the foundation are directed towards um, uh, our mission. And we are intent on using the right type of capital to solve the, the particular problem that's being addressed. Um, what that means is the traditional paradigm in the, in, for most American foundations is that they use relatively traditional investment strategies, relatively conservative in most cases, and are often blind to whatever the mission of that organization happens to be. And we see this over and over again, whether it's a family foundation or a um, corporate foundation or an endowment at a large university. And then the expectation is that the funds that those investments generate, the investment yeah. funds, the investment funds yeah. will then be used in the charitable enterprises so that whether it's 5% as the IRS mandates in the United States or more, if the um, organization has been um, doing well in the market or is intent on spending down their corpus. Um, but the, the, the investment strategy is completely separate from the charitable grant making yeah. strategy. I believe, and what we've been able to demonstrate very robustly at Tara Health Foundation is that you can turn that upside down and you can actually depend on your investment strategy to create as much, if not more, social change mm -hmm. and use your grant making to buttress how well you do your investing. So whether it's in creating infrastructure and Thelma made some great um, examples of how you can build um, community and build infrastructure or it's the landscape assessment so you can identify what are the right problems to solve or you create the tools and we make all of our tools publicly available so others can use them, um, the performance metrics. So those are all things that are grant making that you need to be able to have those um, um, funds available in order to do your investing better. And, and that can look like things like in, in public equity, we're very interested in investing in companies that have the best workplace policies where you've done quite a bit of shareholder engagement into in, in order to make sure that companies have robust reproductive health insurance policies. Um, in the private space, we're very interested in, in bridging that gap between technology, which often happens in academic centers, um, and the commercialization that will happen at Big Pharma. So how do you pull a new science into the pipeline, the capital pipeline, and that's the, the goal of ReAventures. So that's a private equity strategy. Um, we use quite a bit of debt to support women's health clinics in the United States that have a really awkward and um, um, disrupted access to commercial capital. So we'll use, um, mark, you know, maybe um, below market rates, but certainly above um, what a normal foundation would expect in terms of the returns. Um, and ultimately, we consider our performance measurement to be um, a reflection of the sustainability of the organizations we partner with. So if it's a grant, we want those organizations to be able to be sustainable in the long term because they have other sources of revenue, um, because they have um, a reasonable return on the social investment. And certainly in our private and public equity investments, we expect the, the companies that we invest in to be sustainable, to be um, market-based, and to have market-based returns. And we have found um, after six years in business that we are actually making a ton of money. And we can say that with 100% mission alignment, our, both in our public portfolio and our private investing, we are well above market. In the past um, quarter, our investment advisors tell us that we are the best performing portfolio. And um, we're actually having a hard time spending down our corpus because we keep, keep making more money. So, um, we're very excited about the work we're doing. And then the last thing around COVID um, in the United States, what it's, what it's revealed, and you've all touched on it around the world, 
is that the people that are the most impacted by the pandemic are the low wage, often women of color, who are the economic backbone of the um, economy in the United States. And so we've doubled down on our um, uh, issues around the workplace. We're very interested in um, promoting living wage and housing security. Um, we are in, in expanding some of our shareholder engagement work to go into paid leave and other types of workplace issues that we think there's a um, really robust platform um, because it's in, it's in the financial interest of these companies to have that kind of sustainability and security for their workforce. Um, and we are also, um, in, it, we're also being more aggressive in our spend down. We know that money that's sitting in foundations and not being put to use is the, the biggest crime of all, that um, it's our obligation to move money faster. That's right. Exactly. And it's a good problem to have that you have too much money to spend and, and that you're really thinking about how do you utilize um, the resources that you have, as you said, to push it out more quickly to address these really significant and challenging issues. And I know that um, you're passionate about that. So thank you so much for your contribution um, and, and really thinking about from the United States perspective as well, kind of how, how you are looking at investing in women and in these communities in particular as it relates to COVID. So we only have 15 minutes left, which is incredible that we've gone so quickly. Um, but I wanted to ask, and I'd love for everyone to just do two sentences about, so we've talked about fixing systems. So what do you think are the most challenging systems that need to be fixed? And what are your recommended solutions for that? Anybody can jump in. I'm going to jump in. This is a system of finance that um, I love the fact that this talk today did not have gender in the title, that we need to get the word out that this is not about investing in women. It's investing in the health of our economies and our world and that women happen to be the right lever to pull. And that in, when we have to all work, that, that's something that we all have to do to make it clear that the, the largest, you know, the Black Rocks, the in, university endowments, the huge mammoth uh, foundations need to recognize, the pension funds, they need to recognize that this is not just a niche thing, that this is actually the sustainable solution that they need. Um, next year, I would love to hear and Larry Fink, you know, this year he said that I'm not a environmentalist, I'm a capitalist. Next year, I want him to say I'm a feminist. I'm not a feminist, I'm a capitalist because he needs to recognize that gender risk is the biggest um, economic risk. So that's what I want to, that's well what said. I want to fix. Charity, can I, can I jump in? I, I want to want to piggyback back on that in terms of the finance systems and also within that, just sort of new tools. So the one thing that we can we can look at is, and, and, and Ruth was mentioning this, sort of I come out of the philanthropic capital space, but also even we need innovation in that space to provide the right kind of tools, the right kind of capital to put uh, a gender lens on investing in, in the right in the right way. And so we've we pioneered through our work with focusing on COVID response, a rapid response, the right kind of relief capital, capital to help businesses retool and reconfigure their businesses, to build their resilience, to reimagine their businesses anew. And, and with a focus on digitization, but also this recoverable grants and blended finance. So using our capital of grant funding to be catalytic to link it to, whether it's the DFC or whether it's to the Rockefeller Foundation or whomever who, whomever else, or the pri most importantly, the private sector. So I think in the system of finance for us to be more creative with grant making to investment related uh, um, tools and recoverable grants, blended finance that really lead to credit worthiness that lead to management systems for businesses that lead to um, sort of a track record of success to make women owned businesses bankable, scalable, profitable, and long-term sustainable. But it is a blend of capital that these businesses needed at different stages. Um, can I jump in? Can I? Or did you wanna to go to other questions? <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I obviously agree with the the need for change in the financial system. Um, maybe I'll put a slightly different spin on it because um, I, I tend to be very optimi a very optimistic person, and I do think that there's um, some real causes for hope and excitement and more investment through the financial system as a result of COVID. Um, you've seen. Uh, 
literally every government in the world has had some kind of um, COVID response, COVID uh, benefits payment. Uh, and as Thelma said, far too many of them were designed gender blind. A few of them, including in Peru, as Carmen knows, um, were directed only at women. But be that as it may, one interesting, really interesting um, side effect has been you've literally had millions of bank accounts opened for the first time so that government can facilitate those payments into bank accounts directly. And so from I just see this as such an exciting opportunity. You now have these people in the banking system, whether they kind of ever wanted to be or not. <laughs> How do we keep them there? How can we continue to invest uh, in their financial inclusion now that we, we have them in the system? Um, and then just one other really kind of exciting thing that, that we've seen is uh, unlike any other financial crisis that sort of I've been party to, instead of a, or, or been alive for, um, instead of a run on banks, Throughout the developing world, and particularly from low-income people, you have seen an increase in savings deposits. So this, I hope, is sort of a harbinger that people's trust in the banking system has increased. And it also tells us that there's a recognition for the need to save. You've also seen, more so in the last few months, um, a, a dramatic increase at, again, at that low income level in the purchase of insurance products, both agricultural life and health. So there's there's a market answer there and a market response that's building on people's greater willingness and awareness to uh, to interact with the formal financial sector. So I think it's a it's an exciting time to have capital to go into the financial system. Um, where you've maybe got a population that's more open to that investment that's than terrific. ever before. Yeah, really good point. Um, Carmen or Thelma, would you like to add to this or I'll jump to another question. Carmen, yeah, yeah. No, I, I totally agree with Mary Ellen. In, in Latin America, we have been, we have seen an accelerated uh, digital transformation. Well, actually as an organization, we were doing a digital transformation, but we really saw that digital transformation along the region has actually been scaling up. For me, another key challenge, it, it is to start seeing more women in leadership positions and actually investing in Latin America. If you go to the Latin American Venture Capital Association, the LAFCA, of 78 impact investment funds in Latin America, only 27 reported having invested in women-led companies. So we still have tons of tons of space to do there. We have much more to look into this type of investments. And if you look at the funds itself, only 10% of these funds, they have women in their leadership positions or in their investments committee. So I believe that we have to look much more in deep in the positions as women we are in, in, in the investment sector itself. I, I think there That's is right. tons of work Thelma, to be done. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to uh, continue that train of thought. Um, you know, women investors are the visible representation of change, um, particularly uh, on the continent that I live on, on, where you have, you know, we're still very, there's still a lot of gender discrimination culturally and all of that. But in terms of how the investment space works, you know, many investors are gone shy to invest in first time women fund managers, for example. And this is really a challenge because what you have is you have women who have had very successful careers who then want to be fund managers. And then there are all of these stipulations that will never let them move past even the first round of fundraising. And, you know, a man can do whatever he wants and then he starts a fund and everything he's done is looked at when he starts the fund. But when a woman starts a fund, she's looked at on day one, her antecedents don't matter. And, you know, these are, you know, what is track record? How do we conceptualize track record? Whose track are we recording? 
right? And so we, we really need to interrogate these things because they, they are affecting how the sector will, um, will evolve. You know, I, I look, I work with numbers a lot and the question I always ask is why don't these numbers ever go down? Why are we still talking about 33 million women, you know, cannot access finance? And each year, you know, we are all spending foundations, investors, DFIs. The next year, 2021, 33 women cannot access finance. Like, what is it that's going on there? And I think part of it is when you do have people who step out and want to be part of this trajectory of change, the, you know, the, the, the bureaucracies around that are stifling. And so, you know, it, this is the time for us to be creative and also a time for us to encourage, particularly a lot of the women um, that we're interacting with in our accelerator, they're actually thinking of changing sectors because COVID has decimated their sectors. But who is going to invest in them to go into a new sector? I mean, and, you know, everyone still wants you to stay in a sector that is not economically viable. So I think, I think, you know, real life situations are affected by the decisions that we make and also the decisions that people we know in our networks make. And we need to pass this on. It's so true. We have five minutes left, sadly. So we're going to have one lightning round because there's five of you. So a minute each. I'm going to hold you to it. Um, when we think about uh, what we can commit to. So there's been a lot that's been raised about fixing the system, about ways in which we think about it um, from, a, from a positive perspective or a negative perspective. But as it relates to each one of us in our organizations, let's talk about what we can commit to. So concrete opportunities and time-bound goals. Um, does anyone want to start on that? Shining forces. For me, it's key to showing forces. Yeah private sector, non-for-profit, sad organizations, shining process, try to avoid reinventing the, the wheel and, and try to take lessons learned and gain some time. 40% um, of our new fund is uh, must be, or we've committed to invest in um, the countries of Sub-Saharan Africa. So I am committing to come back to Thelma so that we can join Women in African Investments and would love to get your guidance on where we should be looking, who we should be talking to, um, would really, to, to follow Carmen's uh, commitment, would really love to join forces. I would say to continue to really create a portfolio of investable women early stage enterprises as Thelma said I want to I want to sort of solve the problem that the investment capital says exists that they we can't find them they're not out there so how do we we pride ourselves on finding funding and supporting African women entrepreneurs we want to develop them grow them and scale them and we scale them as Carmen said with collaboration and right now to build on the partnerships that a year from now will be transformational and that's partnerships with technology companies like MasterCard technology companies like Microsoft who are looking to do more for women, financial institutions like City, who are trying to do more with women, and really just focusing on um, solving that problem, the pipeline problem, and really putting more women in the position to be ready for investable capital, debt, equity, or other financial uh, opportunities for investment. My commitment is to tell the story and to do what I can to um, make sure that these proof points that we all know and are, um, believe in are actually making it to the mainstream financial markets. Thelma, last word. Okay, thank you. I think, you know, challenge, you know, your own, your previous ways of doing things and, you know, question your own biases, you know, look beyond the obvious, right? Let's look beyond all the people that we normally would invest in and just know that there's so many others that we're not seeing um, and, and do that. And I agree with Ruth. I was going to say tell stories, but Ruth stole mine. So I'm going to say it again, but just let's tell each other stories. And for me, I mean, some of the greatest partnerships are people who tell about uh, tell other people about the work that we're trying to do. I think that has more mileage sometimes than and more currency than, than money. So that's it. Well, I just 
really important conversation. It's so interesting to see what each one of you are doing. And to the point about collaboration and joining forces, I think, you know, we're uniquely all designed to work with one another. So I think there's actually opportunities. This is how my brain works. Um, I think there's opportunities to work with each one of you from the DFC's perspective and amongst one another to identify additional opportunities to invest in women, to really change, um, to Thelma's point, like just shatter what we've thought of in the past as far as um, systems and redesign those so that post COVID, the women are part of this resilience as we rise from this very challenging time. But we just thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today and, and have a wonderful rest of the Concordia Summit. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>